Doc here with Chapter L, Lenses, a short overview of the chapter. We're going to look at the inquiry arc model where we inquire about an image for a lens. Where is the image going to be? We apply our lens rules to find that image. We reflect by looking for an observation that supports our analysis because good science requires analysis and observation. And finally, we communicate our results with the picture and the image characteristics. Well, let's look at the first kind of lens, the diverging lens. And the diverging lens is one that has a cut that's inward on both sides. One side could be flat, which is a neutral side, but here we're gonna look at a cut that's inward on both sides. And the light will then do things based on our ray rules Ray one is parallel to the axis. Remember we have an optic axis here through the center of the optical element like we did with mirrors. And we have here two F points which are considered the focal points. Ray one is parallel and it goes out as if coming from the left F. Now here's how you can remember that rule. If the ray is parallel to the axis, we think F, we always think F, whether it's lenses or mirrors. Now here, if it's diverging, it has to go upward. If it were converging, it would come down. So parallel ray would then converge. But here, the diverging lens makes the light rays go outward. So that ray goes up, and that eye here figures out that that light must have come back from behind it somewhere. So we use a dotted line coming down like that. That's our observer. Ray two is straight through the center. You go straight through the center and there is no bending. Since we have a thin lens, we neglect any shift that would occur with the refraction. So here is a ray right through the center, and where these two rays cross is the image. Notice that we always draw our rays from the top of the object, and then when they cross, or appear to cross, by using dotted lines go backwards, that gives us the top of our image and we're basically planted on the ground, so our feet are on the ground, the feet would be on the ground there. Ray three, which we didn't use, would be one that is ray one backwards. Ray one backwards is to aim at F on the other side, the F on the other side, and then go out parallel. Now, if I did that from this top, I would aim at the F on the other side, down here. I would go out parallel, and it would again appear to come from the same point when I, if I have an eyeball out here to the right. But we only need two rays to get the conclusion. We have the conclusion, and here we see the observation where we have my daughter, Krista, and I am holding a diverging lens in front. We're holding diverging lenses in front, and you see baby faces. You see smaller faces. See, this is the baby face, and here's the face itself, the object. So you see the baby face, and that's reflecting on our analysis to give us an observation. And finally, we communicate the results, the characteristics of the image. Along with the diagram, we communicate these three things. The three things are virtual image, since we use the dotted line to get there, smaller, the baby face, and upright. And we got it, the image characteristics. Let's look at another lens. This is the converging lens. And here the cut is the other way. It bows outward on each side. And the three rays, which are similar to the rays in the previous case, but there's some differences. Here, since it's converging, the ray one that's parallel will actually go through F on the other side rather than appear to have come from F on the left side, like it did here. So this ray will actually bend and go through F. Ray two is the same, goes right through the center. And here you see we are finished. We have light coming from that point it appears to come from that point actually it does come from that point so it is a real image it actually goes to that point and passes through ray three is the ray one backwards ray one backwards would be instead of going parallel and through f we go through f and then out parallel see how that's nice ray three is always ray one backwards here i put it in to show you that you could use it but really i recommend you using two rays only since it's quicker, faster to do that. So the image is here upside down and it is smaller. And here we have the observation, my wife holding a lens and 
far back there, you see the deck, and the deck is here upside down. See, the top of the deck here is up there, and the posts that go down, they would actually go up over here. So my wife's holding the lens here, looking at our deck, and we're looking at the image between the lens and, and us, the observer. We're seeing here an upside-down version of the deck. Now let's go on to another case, again with converging lens, and here we're going to put the object fairly close to the focal point. See, in the previous case, we had the object fairly far away, and that's when you get your small images. When you're close to the focal point, like this, you're going to get something different. If we apply our ray rules here, ray 1, parallel and through F, and ray 2 straight through the center, then the rays cross at this point and these observers conclude that the image tip is here. It's a real image since light really goes there. We did not need to use dotted lines to do that. And if we look at the observation here, as we reflect on our analysis, we have a little wizard that's sitting there on the mantle and my wife has a lens here showing a big wizard head upside down. The little hat, the wizard hat is upside down. So the cute little wizard that's on the mantle appears large and upside down. So there's a wizard on the mantle, that would be the object. My wife holding the lens, that would be the lens here. And then the upside down big wizard head is right there. And we are looking further away in the direction looking toward the mantle. So this would be us way out here. Notice that light doesn't bend in the middle of the lens. It bends toward the normal at the first air glass interface and then at the glass uh, air glass interface it bends toward the normal and glass air it bends away from the normal. And here we use poetic license and we use the rule that says it bends once magically in the middle. Uh, this will head toward F anyway so we get the same result. We have a thin lens. We don't have to worry about this approximation. So uh, we have here to two rays, ray one, ray two. If you wanted ray three, it would be ray one backwards. Now ray one is parallel and then through F. So backwards would be through F, through this F, and then out parallel. And so you would, you would get the same result. You would come through here and go out parallel and it would go through the top, tip of the point there, upside down. At the center of the lens, here you have a refraction toward the normal and then away from the normal. It's a little bit of a shift, but for a thin lens, this shift is basically negligible. So we can say that the light passes straight through. But this is a nice little analysis that refers back to earlier in the course where we looked at refraction. And in that case, we go from air to glass. You bend toward the normal. See here, that's toward the normal. This would be toward the normal and you bend it away from the normal when you leave the glass air to go in the air and you can see in these cases that these rules support these rules they come from these rules this is the focal length the distance from the lens to the point f and you have a focal length on each side and uh, that's uh, neat to see focal lengths for these lenses we had a focal point for the mirrors and now we see that we have two focal points where in the first case of the diverging lens the focal point is virtual the light appears to come from the focal point when it comes in parallel while for the converging lens it actually goes to the focal point let's look at the final uh, communication here it would be real larger and inverted for the image characteristics let's look now at another case this is the very rich converging lens that has another mode when you're very very close you have the magnifying glass if you have the newspaper and then the magnifying glass you see big print and that's an observation we've all have seen there's my daughter putting the magnifying glass in front of her and then we see 
her big head. See, that's the big head. So there's my daughter's head here, the object, and then she's holding the lens in front of her, and we're over here looking at the big head. Well, let's see if we can do the theory here. We've kind of gone in reverse here. We've done the experiment first, the observation. The theory says parallel, go through F, and then go through the center for ray two, and these two rays appear to come from way back here, and that then basically concludes uh, for us that the image is bigger. The image is virtual. Light doesn't really go there. Uh, we have used dotted lines to locate the image. It is larger and it is upright. It's the converging lens used as a magnifying glass. They're your image characteristics. Uh, here we have uh, lenses listed from most converging to most diverging. This is a neutral lens in the middle. It basically is no lens. It's like a pane glass window. Uh, the cut is straight, so we wouldn't even say that's a lens. If you put that on, uh, say, for your glasses, for your eyes, it's not going to do anything. It's like looking through a regular window. If you need uh, eyeglasses, you, this won't do you any good. So this is a converging lens on each side. It gives a converging effect. This is neutral on one side, but converging on the other. This is neutral, neutral, and this is then diverging on one side and double diverging here. Now let's look at the uh, various definitions here to introduce diopters. Uh, diopters is important later in our course when we do eyeglasses. And the definition of diopters is 1 over f, where f is in meters. Now I have the focal length f in meters here, so let's just do the 1 over trick and see what happens. Well, what's 1 over 0 0.01? That's like saying how many pennies are in a dollar. The answer is 100. What is 1 over 0 0.1? That's like saying how many dimes are in a dollar. Well, the answer is 10. Now, 1 divided by 1 is 1. How many dollar bills are in a dollar? 1. And here, if you have 1 divided by infinity, 1 over a large number, you get very, very small result. In fact, as the limit approaches infinity, 1 over a big number as it approaches infinity, the number that you're dividing by, then the answer is going to be, be 0. It's going to approach 0. It's like dividing a pizza pie up with an infinite amount of people. You're getting nothing. And that's important to note because it's basically saying that the lens that's neutral has reduced to a neutral case, a pane glass window. It doesn't do anything. The light ray goes through. It, it's not going to focus anywhere. So it's like if this were slightly curved, it would then focus a zillion miles or meters to the right. But if it's flat, it's not going to focus at all. So we say the focal length is infinite. Remember that a focal length that's large is a weak lens. It's not doing much. While if the light bends very, very much to have a short focal length, that's a strong lens. And that's why the eye doctor loves diopters, because the number is bigger for the stronger lens. The very short focal length is a very strong lens, but see this number is then large and reflects that. These negative numbers refer to the diverging lens. Uh, where the light diverges instead of converges, and we do the same thing, just include the minus sign. So 1 divided by 1 is 1. The minus sign is there for diverging, and this is 1 over 0 0.1, which gives you the 10 with the minus sign because the minus sign is here. And pennies into a dollar, 100, but the minus sign is there, so you have the minus sign. So these are your diopters. Another definition for diopters, which is equivalent to this one, is to divide the focal length into 100, where the focal length is in centimeters, and you get the same result. See, for example, here, if we consider this uh, top one, when we did it before, we had 1 divided by 0 0.01. That's like how many pennies in a dollar, and we got 100. Here, what we would do is actually write the focal length in terms of centimeters. Well, that's 1 centimeter. That's like 1 cent. So you actually think cents, like pennies. Then you would have 100 pennies divided by 1 penny. You still get 100. So that's neat to have both formulas. And we're going to apply these formulas below in our last uh, table here. And what we have here, we have a set of lenses. We have a 5 diopter lens, a 10 diopter, a 20 diopter, and a minus 10 diopter. These three are converging because they have positive values, and this is diverging because it's negative. The strongest lens is the one with the highest diopter value, which is the 20. So for the strongest lens in a set, I could write down the 20 diopter one, 20, and then to find the focal length, the focal length here, I'm going to use the formula where I have the 100 divided by diopters. Let me just go back and make one observation here. When you have these formulas, you can always swap diopters in F. 
this is like saying 3 is equal to like 6 over 2. You could always swap the 3 and a 2. 2 is 6 divided by 3. 3 is 6 divided by 2. You always do that trick. So here, I can write the focal length in centimeters by swapping with the diopters. So 100 over diopters is the focal length in centimeters. Just swap these two. You can always do that. I prefer to use this formula with the 100 here, this version, because I have the focal length in this table listed as desired to be in centimeters. Now, the other rule that we need to know here is that when you slap two lenses together, you add the diopters. That's why diopters are very, very important. You can't add the focal lengths. You get nonsense if you do that. You have to add the diopters. So here, the strongest lens in the set is the 20 diopters. And what's the focal length using the formula? What's 20 into 100? The answer is 5. 5 centimeters. The weakest converging lens in the set would be the positive one that has the lowest value in diopters, which would be the 5. And what's that focal length? Well, you divide 5 into 100, you get 20. The diverging lens in the set's the negative one, that's the minus 10. And if you divide 10 into 100, you get 10. And the minus sign needs to be preserved because that tells us that we have a diverging lens. What about taking the strongest combination of two lenses? Well, the strongest combination of two lenses would be the 10 and the 20. And remember, diopters add, so that's 30 diopters. And what is 30 into 100 is 3.33. What about combining the 5 diopters and 20 diopter lenses? If you do that, you have then 5 plus 20 is 25. And the focal length is given by taking the diopter value, 25, and divide it into 100, and you get 4. What's the net diverging combination? Now, diverging means negative, so you have to take the negative 10 add it to one of these and still get a negative. Well, that's going to have to be the 5. So the 5 and the minus 10, when you add those together, you get minus 5. Uh, I have $5 in my pocket. I have an IOU for 10. I'm in the red, 5 bucks. Then if I take the 5 and divide it into 100, because that's my diopters, I get minus 20. So this is neat to see how this works, the formulas, and go over these a few times, and you'll get the uh, hang of it. And we'll be using these later when we looked at look at prescription of eyeglasses. This is a, a neat little uh, invention. This is Fresnel lens, the Fresnel lens, when Fresnel was trying to solve the problem of making lenses for lighthouses and to have light, a light lens that doesn't weigh very much, he noticed that the light basically bends at the interface. That's where the action is, from air to glass. And once you're inside the glass, really, that's not going to do you any good, but you go from glass to air. So what he did is said, remove most of the glass. So you just have that curved part here. Take that glass away. That's where the bending is going to take place. In other words, we're considering one side being flat to simplify. And then this is the curved surface that will get us some converging effect. Throw this glass away or save it. And then this is somewhat fragile, so why not just break these little uh, sections and flatten it out so you have these rings, flatten it out here. And he did that, and it worked. Good enough. Uh, it still works. So that's the Fresnel lens used in theaters. Very, very nice. And lighthouses. Has less weight. This is a Coney Island trick from 1922 where you have an object, an elephant, and here is a lens that gives you an elephant that's smaller and upside down. Here's ray two through the center, ray three through uh, F on the left side and out parallel. And then you uh, pretend this is your object for the second lens and do the problem over again. I have a parallel ray that goes through the second focal uh, point, And then I have ray two goes through the center. And then you see a smaller version of the smaller version of the elephant. Elephant gets flipped two times because it's inverted once, inverted again. So it puts it back upright and you see the miniature elephant on frosted glass screen. So here are the uh, observers looking at the frosted gla glass screen. There you put some glass here, like frosted glass. You can see uh, as a stage and people are over on this side looking at it, see a little baby elephant. They could take your date back there and you would see your little uh, date here, two or three inches on that screen and, and be freaked out because this is the time before television. Well, I hope you enjoy this overview of Chapter L, the sign off for now, Doc. I'll see you later.